confounded. Why not see our sunny? work on it, I'm gonna have good posture. It's just so hard to like constantly be reminding yourself. Hi, I'm Clara Wagner with Talk Back for Teens and for this episode, which is on depression, we're doing our forum segment as a compilation of different interviews with people who have had um, experience with depression and related mental health stuff. And since I have personal experience with that, I'm switching places with our expert from our Ask an Expert segment, and Lindsay's actually going to be interviewing me. So, hi. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for doing this. Thank you. So can you tell us a little bit about your experience with depression? Sure. Uh, so, kind of my primary mental health issue um, has been an eating disorder, which I've had since about my sophomore year of high school. And I never saw myself as somebody with depression, um, but I started more intensive treatment for my eating disorder this past winter, and it was something that they kind of kept bringing up of like, are you sure, you know, it really sounds, and I think um, I've always had high functioning depression that, you know, I never had trouble getting out of bed, and I was very, very, very um, motivated and I stayed engaged with friends but for me it was always more there wasn't anything that I was looking forward to I was kind of just like going through these very rigid motions mm -hmm. um, which I was able to maintain but there wasn't any of that happiness joy real connection um, so in tandem with treating the eating disorder depression has been added in with that um, so yeah how did you first figure out then that the depression and the eating disorder were something that was a problem at that point? Well, so obviously at different points. The eating disorder was much, much earlier. There was a long, long period of feeling like, is there something wrong with my eating? I don't know. I kind of eat, you know. But for me, it was never focused on, oh, I want to drop these pounds. I want to lose this weight. So I thought, that's when eating disorder is so if I'm not focusing on losing weight I must not have an eating mm -hmm. disorder um but basically google the you know figured my eating was I I was thinking more and more about it and I had more anxiety about it and so you know figured it out via googling stuff um and then depression like I said was largely my therapist and treatment provider kind of kept bringing it up as something to think about and then Definitely the question that struck home was, you know, what are you looking forward to or what's something that you enjoy doing in the mm -hmm. past two weeks and just kind of like. Nothing. Yeah, that feeling of like, oh, OK. Um, and then still struggling sometimes with like feeling like, I don't know, am I really depressed? Am I just going through bad days? Whatever. And it, I think it's a hard thing because it is so in intangible sometimes. But what was that like for you when they were kind of giving that label and putting it out for you? I don't know. I think in some ways it was relieving or gratifying to kind of have that sink in. And I think for a long time I'd kind of felt like there was something wrong with me and that like, well, like, I hang out with my friends, but I don't really like them, so I must just mm -hmm. be a bad friend, you know, or like, oh, you know, I dread going to this club, so I must just not really care about what I'm doing and stuff like that. And so I think it was definitely relieving to be like, oh, okay, you know, it's not that I'm just a crappy daughter, that I'm really irritable with my mom and dad. It's that, you know, I'm, I'm going through something. And obviously the eating disorder was tied up in that too, but, um, yeah, I think it was kind of, Kind of relieving, and but also a little bit stressful because it was that, it because it wasn't clear cut, and I like things to be clear cut. So it's like, well, I maybe have depression, but I maybe don't. And I don't know, and I don't like this. So, yeah. <laughs> Did you know anything about depression or eating disorders before you started seeing your therapist? Um, I was super super ignorant about eating disorders for a very long time, um, and you know, very much just saw them as skinny girls trying to get skinnier um which it's not um 
and then depression I think I knew more about. I'd had different friends that had experiences with it in different capacities, but I also think that it was just something that I just kind of like heard more about or read more about. So I think depression, I feel like I was pretty well educated about. Eating disorders, I think I had a lot of misunderstandings. Do you think what you saw as your friend's experience of depression influenced how it was for you when you say it was kind of hard for you because it wasn't clear cut? Do you think some of that came from how you saw it in your friends? Absolutely. Um, because I think they demonstrated more of the, you know, sleeping, you know, from 10 p.m. to 11 mm -hmm. in the morning um, or not being able to show up for anything, you know, really struggling in school um, because they didn't have the motivation to get stuff done. And I was always very much on the other end of things where it's, you know, I'm up at six to do my homework, to do this, to do this. And so I just felt like, you know, I, I don't fit into that picture of what I had as depression. That makes sense. What has been the most helpful for you as far as getting back to uh, able to enjoy that happiness and look for joy? A lot of things. I mean, I, I, it's taken a lot, and I think mm -hmm. it's still a work in progress. I think for everybody, that's always, to some extent, a work in progress. Um, honestly, like for me, intensive treatment, I was in a partial hospitalization program for about three months, um, and I think that kind of like really intensive environment was, was what I needed, mm -hmm. and that was really helpful just in creating structure and providing a lot of support. Um, but I think, I think just slowing down, and I think that's a part of what I needed with the treatment program I was in, is that like I was in treatment all day. Like I couldn't be trying to be productive all the time, and I had to take a medical leave from school, so I couldn't be obsessing over grades. And I'd been using those things as coping mechanisms to mm -hmm. really kind of like shut down all of the feelings that I was having. And so there was definitely a period where it was incredibly, incredibly painful to kind of thaw as everything slowed down and all the feelings started catching up to me and it was just terrible for a little while. Um, but I think just that process of slowing down and being forced to sit with things and figure out things and go through the very long process that is, you know, rediscovering what do you like? You know, mm -hmm. for a while that was such a hard question. Like, what do you like? I don't know. I just do things. Um, you know, what you like, what you enjoy, who, you know, you want to be connected with. I think that by slowing down was really how I've been able to start to do that. So you mentioned that you used to use school and staying busy kind of as your coping skills. What are some of the healthy coping skills you use now? Um, that was definitely something that was really pushed hard by my treatment team and stuff like that. Um, one, like, talking and communication. I've always been a, a bit of a talker. Like, I like talking and processing things, but I think in the past I'd more focused on talking about other people's problems. Mm -hmm. And so um, being a lot more open about mine and not seeing that as a burden. Um, so I think that's been huge. I think... I fought it for a really long time, but coloring, I thought it was really dumb That's a big one. and stupid and pointless and whatever. And I find that it really just, just having that very simple thing to focus on is very calming. Um, I have a stress ball I carry with me all the time. Really like my stress ball. Um, having certain music, you know, I've got like my anxiety playlist and my whatever playlist and I like that. Um, my dog, mm -hmm. just like knowing that when I'm feeling rough, my dog will make me feel better. And then just lots of little tasks in terms of like, I know that, you know, doing the dishes is really good for taking my mind off things. Cleaning my room is really good for taking my mind off things. So yeah. Gardening. Gardening. Exactly. Like whatever you do. Yeah. And also, um, getting outside in ways that aren't physical, because I think I'd always connected being outside with 
I'm a big runner, so like running and exercise. Mm -hmm. um, and for a while, exercise was kind of put Off aside for my recovery, right? And so I disconnected with nature then because it was like, why would I go outside if I'm not going for a run? And so realizing they're like, oh, you can just go outside and sit or go outside and take pictures or go outside and walk and kind of that being really calming. Was medication at all a part of your recovery? Yeah, so that was definitely, and I still, like, medication is still just, like, I don't, like, it just makes me, like, frustrated to talk about. Um, for a while, it wasn't. Um, and then I started having, I I have experience with um, self-harm, and that started getting worse. It's kind of like the eating disorder started mm -hmm. getting taken away, so I was, like, holding on to that, and there's more suicidal ideation, so they kind of started pushing it more in terms of, like, you should be getting some relief from this, and you know, you just need something right now. Um, so did go on a low dosage of antidepressant and like could never tell if there was a difference or not. Mm -hmm. um, at some point switched, never could really tell if that made a difference. Um, at one point kind of was like, eh, got like patchy about taking it and then had like a month where I didn't take it and couldn't tell if that made a difference but I think it did and I think that I did start to struggle more then so then I have since gotten back on it um so I have taken medication I'm currently taking medication but I don't know what it does for me or doesn't do for me were you pretty good about advocating for yourself and being honest with your doctors about how you felt the medication made you feel Yes, I was. I think for me it's always been hard in that, like I said, I like clear-cut things, and I think medication is very much a, we'll try this and see, mm -hmm. and we'll try this and see, and they don't have a, you know, you have this, this, and this, so I will give you this much of this, yep. and that'll be the, you know, the solution. So, so yeah, I think I was able to say, mm, I, like, I don't know, I've been noticing this, but on the other hand, it could be from this. Um, and, you know, I think they were just ready to kind of go through that process of trial and error, essentially, but informed trial and error, I guess. <laughs> mm, that's, that's a lot of it, is yeah. the trial and error. Try it, try it for two weeks, three weeks, a month, see what right. happens. Yeah. That's really frustrating, too. How comfortable are you at this point sharing your experiences with others? I think it really depends on the context. I think, so, I was diagnosed officially with an eating disorder my junior year and up, you know, let me think, the four years after that, the only people that knew were my parents and one friend, you know, my boyfriend of three years didn't know, my best friend didn't know, and I absolutely was not comfortable talking about it. And then when I had to go on my medical leave from college, I kind of needed a reason for like, well, like I'm going on a medical leave then. So kind of like over the span of a, a week, like everybody knew in terms of my team at school, all my friends at school, family members, friends at home. Um, and I think since then I've gotten a lot more comfortable just because I kind of had to because it was out. Um, I think because... I still feel like eating disorders and depression are something that's really largely misunderstood. I definitely hesitate to share it unless, A, I think that person is likely to kind of like be educated about it, or B, I'm gonna like sit down and really like have a conversation with them about it. Usually I just keep things vague. So like, oh, you know, I took a mental health related medical leave or, oh, I'm just home figuring some stuff out or um, I had some mental health challenges and let people think what they may. And a lot of the time, I don't think people feel super comfortable asking questions. So usually the conversation stops there. The stigma about the mental health yeah. can be a lot to handle. Yeah, right. So kind of keeping that in mind, what could you recommend for people who their family members, their loved ones, their boyfriends, their girlfriends are struggling with mental health, depression, eating disorders, anxiety? Yeah, so I think for me the biggest thing is ask questions. Um, 
and everything from like you know I read this online is that true Mm -hmm. and for me like yes sometimes somebody's gonna say something that's like a little bit triggering or a little bit offensive or just like totally like off on left field and I'd be like no that's absolutely not true or like oh I kind of wish you hadn't said that Mm -hmm. but I think that's the only way that you get to that place where they know how to help and Mm -hmm. I think you can ask ask direct questions how can I help you know like what support do you need me to play in your life um and know that that's going to be changing and that they might not know the answer sometimes that was the most frustrating answer for somebody to ask me is like you know what you what do you need me to do and I just be like I don't know but Mm -hmm. you're not doing any of it and I need to do something else but I don't know what it is um but I think just kind of like getting it not to be an elephant in the room and just like desensitizing yourself where you know you can talk about whatever um because I think that's the way you figure out how to handle it. Because I think it's really different for everybody what role they want their loved ones to play and which loved ones to play. That's a really good point. Being a professional, I'm kind of curious if you could have a 100% open conversation with any or all of the people that you've encountered in the mental health field. Is there anything you wish you could tell them, don't do this, do this? I feel like sometimes people get in routines and we're not always the most helpful we can be either. Yeah. I don't know. I think... I think one... And I think... I've had mixed experiences with different treatments. So obviously some people it's like they know this Mm -hmm. and they did great and some people are like, well, they might, might... affect the way they did something I don't know um but just realizing that I think for the most part for them especially people who are starting therapy um or are starting a new level of treatment or whatever you know they're coming into your office or whatever you know terrified and I think most people it feels like their world is just kind of like shattering and in pieces and that their life and I think you guys, it's like, oh, yeah, I saw, like, six people like you in the past hour. I mean, every case is different. Mm -hmm. But I think you guys have such a bigger perspective on, okay, you know, things get better and things take time and, you know, I've seen worse and and stuff like that. But that for them, you know, it really feels like, you know, this is the end of my life or this is never going to get better. And Mm -hmm. there's... I think for so many challenges when people go through them you don't have that perspective so you're so zoomed in on just these bad feelings that that's all you know yeah that's a really good point so you feel like you're better I mean better depends on how you're qualifying it better isn't all better no absolutely not I don't think I'll ever be all better but better than I was absolutely yeah um, you know, even thinking back to a year ago, I was really scared, um, and was in a really, really bad spot and didn't have any of the insider tools or support that I needed. And now, um, you know, there are still days that I struggle, but when I do struggle, I'm not helpless and I'm not alone and... I have that kind of perspective to say like, yeah, I'm struggling today and I struggled Mm -hmm. a month ago and I'll probably struggle next month, but tomorrow might be a better, you know, just being able to kind of say like, all right, I've been through this before. Like I'm more of a veteran, the struggle days, (laughs) whatever. So having that experience, what do you feel like you have that maybe other people don't as far as life experience going forward? I think, and I think this is me personally, because I know other people that I've gone through treatment with definitely don't have this. Um, But for me, just kind of like a strong faith that like things work out. Um, And I I don't know exactly how I can say that because I know people who it hasn't worked Mm -hmm. out with, you know, I've I've lost friends um, to mental health issues, but I guess just like for me, like no matter how bad it's gotten, there always is that 
it gets better. Um, and, and it seems to me that like, if you can wait out whatever you're going through and if you can just hold on long enough through whatever the bad throws at you, it does get better. And so I think just that like, you know, like I might not, you know, you might not know what you want to be what you, when you grow up or you might be broke or like your boyfriend might have just broken up with you or whatever. Um, but just that like it'll be okay at mm -hmm. some point in some way. What is the one thing that you would like to tell people watching this tonight? I think for people who might be struggling with anything, and I think most people are, um, I think this is the same thing you said for years, but like, you know, reach out and get help. Um, and that keep reaching out for help until you find a help that works because sometimes you love your parents and they're the best but sometimes they don't know what to do and sometimes your friends don't know what to do mm -hmm. and it's not that they don't love you or that they're not good people it's that these things are hard things um, but eventually you will hit that person that it just you talk to them and it feels like the ah oh, like thank you um, and that I think that person will be that's your first step in kind of like getting better and then for people who you know are more stable or more kind of from the looking at other people um struggling with this or whatever um i think do do your homework on these kinds of things um and just be aware you know be aware in terms of yourself you know like for me i think the whole world could just do with being more aware of like where are you at mm -hmm. um, where are the people around you at I think we can go kind of in our parallel tracks and just not know where the person next to us is at whether that be our friend our sister our mom our dad and so just having those check-ins like with ourselves like how am I doing today and with those people that we don't you know like mom like how are you doing like are you happy with your life like right now like what made your day yesterday? Mm -hmm. What was the worst part of your day today? Um, I just think those things draw us a lot closer and make our lives a lot richer. And then A, can prevent things from getting bad because those connections are already there for when things need to be talked about. But also if things are bad, that's kind of a step for helping everybody to get out of places that they're in. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, this has been Clara Wagner with Talkback for Teens. You can find more on our website and join the discussion at talkbackforteens.com. Thanks. I believe if you wanted to leave, you would. I mean, I no. Yeah, there's no safe place. No safe place. Cool. These are what are typical things teenagers might go to. Grab your dope and your shell go shoes. Go and fax your lawyer. All the dirt you wander through. All the dirt you wander through. Like in retrospect, I probably would have mentioned writing as a coping mechanism, definitely. All you floats down Flatbush Avenue, all run through. Like in retrospect, I probably would have mentioned all writing as a coping mechanism, them, definitely. All you do, sell your house to the bankers, sell your chat skis and papers to get the hell out of Kensington, all the dirt you wander. Nobody likes you, nobody you like likes you now. 
feelings are harder than people think they are.